Hello, welcome. Um, and today we will hold our expert webinar to discuss democracy in the Middle East and its current challenges. A lot has happened since the Arab Spring, a historic event that still resonates to today's issues. Um, and we are happy to further elaborate on uh, those issues. Uh, we are happy to announce our two speakers from today. Uh, the first that will speak is Alex McDonald, who is a reporter for Middle East Eye, Middle East Eye on Bahrain, uh, on the topic of Bahrain, the Gulf, and the crushing of democracy. Our second speaker will be Sam uh, Mantouf, uh, who is a consultant and will discuss uh, democracy in the Middle East in practice. Our third speaker, Dr. Matthew Krippen, uh, is a researcher in the artist group, um, but he has a pre-recorded lecture on Egypt and the Middle East, democracy, anti-democracy, and pragmatic faith, uh, which we held yesterday, but we will add this to the final webinar, uh, which will be placed on YouTube, our site, and as a podcast. Um, so without further ado, uh, Alex McDonald, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, before I begin, I'll just point out that, as you said, I'm a reporter and a journalist, so um, what I'm going to be sort of talking about today is going to be kind of based on some of the reporting I've been doing over the last few years and uh, kind of more recently around um, the situation in Bahrain and, and I suppose the Gulf more generally. And the sort of topic I'm going to be focusing on to some extent is uh, the kind of um, complicity of uh, the international community in, well, what has effectively been the, the, the collapse and the crushing of the uh, pro-democracy movement. So I think, I think it's fair to say that as a whole, the major world powers didn't exactly cover themselves in glory when it came to the, uh, to the Arab Spring. Throughout much of the international community's response, there's been a tendency towards either supporting the status quo or attempting to hijack popular movements for their own geopolitical ends. In the case of Bahrain though, and the Gulf more broadly, the willingness to turn a blind eye to mass repression and the snuffing out of movements towards popular sovereignty and democracy has been blatant and arguably nakedly cynical. In his recent book, A Promised Land, uh, Barack Obama candidly writes about how in March 2011, as the Saudis and Emirati sent in their security forces to help repress the pro-democracy uprising in Bahrain, he stood back and did little for fear of damaging relations with the three Gulf countries. Of course, under the Trump presidency, this policy reached its peak. Trump promised and large, largely delivered a reset in relations, removing the very limited armed sanctions that existed in Bahrain and giving the nod for governments across the Gulf to act with total impunity in eliminating opponents and riding roughshod over civil liberties and human rights. Over the past decade, political repression in Bahrain has reached previously unimaginable levels. While it was never a real democracy, prior to 2011, the kingdom had a reputation for a higher degree of civil society participation compared with the absolutism of its neighbors as well as holding elections for the lower house of parliament and allowing the publication of one independent newspaper, al Wasa. Though political parties were banned, so-called societies were allowed that functioned in a similar manner, most notably the Islamist al Wafaq and the secular left-wing National Democratic Labour Action Society, or WAH. Both of these groups have now been forcibly dissolved and their leaders have been imprisoned, while al Wasa was shut down in 2017. Are thought to be around 4,000 political prisoners in the kingdom's jails and torture is rife. 27 people are currently on death row in the kingdom, with 26 at risk of imminent execution. Leaders of the democracy movement, such as Abdul Hadi al Khawaja and Hassan Mushayma, still languish in jail, while others, such as Nabil Rajab and Syed al Wadahi, are under house arrest or in exile. The latter, like many others, has also had his citizenship stripped. Just this week, Human Rights Watch revealed that a group of children arrested while protesting for the 10th anniversary of the uprising last month were threatened by police with rape and electric shocks while held in detention. Activists have described the total absence of space for organisation or public dissent in the kingdom. Journalists, clerics, civil society leaders and lawyers have all faced arrests, travel bans, the threat of violence or imprisonment. At the same time, Relations between Bahrain's rulers and the West have arguably only improved. This is an issue that's been highlighted by the many brave activists working in the diaspora and the few journalists who still take an interest in the country. While the Obama administration did apply a limited arms embargo on the country, much of this was lifted in 2015 as the threat of the Islamic State group in Iraq and Syria saw human rights concerns take a backseat and mobilizing allies against the jihadist group. 
Bahrain is the location of the US, Navy, uh, US Navy's fifth fleet and has one of the highest concentrations of US troops in the region. Then in 2020, with US mediation, Bahrain followed the UAE in signing a normalization deal with Israel, becoming only the fourth Arab state to do so. The move was taken without popular support from the kingdom's population and sparked off rare street protests as the opposition decried the effective abandonment of the Palestinians to continued statelessness and subjugation. For its part, the former colonial power Britain, from whom Bahrain gained national independence in 1971, has been arguably the kingdom's most prominent international sponsor. The UK opened a permanent naval base at Mina Salman port in 2018, with then Foreign Minister Philip Hammond describing it as a watershed moment in the UK's commitment to the region. And while the British royal family may be engulfed in its own crisis of legitimacy at the moment, it should be perhaps of more concern that members of the family have met with autocratic Middle East monarchies over 200 times since 2011. And out of these, our AD royals accounted for the most meetings. But when questioned on the ongoing human rights abuses, the UK government has repeatedly claimed that the kingdom is improving or reforming. The Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry, or BICI, which was established in June, 11, uh, June 2011, took testimony from numerous activists about the abuse they received in the wake of the Arab Spring uprising. It documented 46 deaths, 559 allegations of torture, and more than 4,000 examples of employees being sacked for taking part in demonstrations. The results of the inquiry were accepted by the government, who promised to implement the report's recommendations. But 10 years later, there has been little in the way of implementation. And the situation in terms of human rights is, as I've already mentioned, arguably worse than it has ever been. But despite this, Britain's foreign or British Foreign Office Minister Tari Ahmed told the House of Commons in May that the UK continued to believe Bahrain was taking steps in the right direction to improve its human rights record, in line with the recommendations set out in the 2012 BICI report. Closer to home, Saudi Arabia has, since the March 2011 intervention, spent billions attempting to shore up the Bahraini regime and prevent the emergence on its doorstep of an upstart democratic state. The kingdom has, of course, also repeatedly framed the opposition in Bahrain in sectarian terms, claiming to see the hand of regional rival Iran behind every move the mostly Shia opposition makes. The Saudis, it should be added, have applied a similar logic to their own Shia min uh, minority, highlighted with such incidents as the execution of cleric Sheikh Nimr al Nimr in 2016 and the siege of the town of Al Amir in 2017, which led to dozens of deaths, and more than 20,000 people fleeing their homes. This mirrors the sectarianism that has taken place in Bahrain over the decades, which has been uh, cultivated partly as a way of encouraging divide and rule sectarian hostility towards the country's Shia majority, as has the tolerance of fiercely anti Shia Salafist clerics. Nabil Rajab was handed one of his many, many jail sentences in 2014 for accusing the Bahraini state of being the first ideological incubator of the, of the Islamic State's ideology in Bahrain. These factors have led the Bahraini regime to operate in total lockstep with Saudi Arabia in regional affairs, not least as part of the coalition prosecuting the war in Yemen. The combined protection offered by the triumvirate of the US, the UK and Saudi Arabia to the Bahraini government is difficult for uh, supporters of reform to overcome. A high profile opposition figure recently told me that he had been informed by American diplomats that they could not affect change in Bahrain unless the British agreed and the British wouldn't agree unless the Saudis agreed. At the moment, there seems to be little hope of a serious change in relations between the West and the Gulf rulers though. Although Joe Biden has made noises about changing the relationship between America and Saudi Arabia, his refusal to take action against Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman even after an intelligence report directly blamed him for the death of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi, suggests that geopolitics will still override human rights concerns. And with Britain attempting to make leaving the European Union work and explore a bravely world of deregulated capitalist enterprise, combined with the current government's strategy of pursuing a culture war, which has included the demonization of human rights lawyers, it seems unlikely that human rights concerns in a foreign country will be high on their agenda either. Some optimists have pinned their hopes on Bahrain's new prime minister, Salman bin Hamad al Khalifa, seen as more of a reformer compared to his predecessor, Khalifa bin Salman, who died in November. There are hopes this could lead to a lessening of the pressure on the opposition groups and a return to dialogue. However, even the most sincere reformer would need to deal with decades, even centuries, of entrenched authoritarianism and chauvinism that is unlikely to be swept away from within the palace.
What ultimately will matter in determining the future of Bahrain, as well as other states in the region, is popular power. Democracy is measured not just at the ballot box or by the principles of freedom of expression and assembly, but also the ability of ordinary people to shape their own lives and use their collective power, particularly labor power, to control events. With the continued crumbling of the global economic order and the mounting threat from climate change, making life more precarious and unstable across the globe. Over and over, mass movements have shown they can overcome tyrannical rulers, and it is this, not the threat of international sanctions or condemnations by foreign governments and bodies, that creates change in a society. And internationally, there needs to be similar movements in our own countries that offer solidarity and pressure our governments to drop their material support for repressive regimes. Only that way can a true democracy develop. Thank you very much. Um, we'll first uh, yeah, listen to Sam, and afterwards we'll have a short Q&A as well. Uh, we have some questions. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> Sam? Yes, thank you. Well, um, it was an, an interesting uh, point of view, Alex. And from, from my side, well, I'm going to be more focused towards democracy in action in, in the region and um, how really countries that are labeled as democratic are actually doing with, with real democracy when it comes to day-to-day -day activities and how the people are actually coping with what is labeled as democracy versus what they, they really live uh, in that sense. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm open to your questions on, on, on that. Okay. Um, so when talking about democracy, like the first thing people often think about is the voting part as part of the basis, but what are other ways to create democracy and how to make sure voting is done in an appropriate and honest manner? Well, yeah, that, that's kind of exactly what I was trying to, to imply for. So indeed people in, in quite a few region, uh, countries in the region do vote but then when you really look in, in, in details, you see, for example, in Lebanon, the head of parliament has been there since 1992, since the end of the civil war. And if you try to hear what people on the streets in, in the most current uh, rebellions say, they're really against those old regimes and they really wanna break free out of them. And then when they are offered the option to vote, all of a sudden the same people are reelected. So, so they're, Democracy gives voting as a way out, but then the question is how honest is this vote and how, is, how well is it helping those countries break free from external influences and really helping them take control over the way they actually wanna live their, their lives? Well, in a way the same applies to Syria. The president has been there since 2000 and even though the um, this, the, the internal civil war has actually had a try at actually changing the president, but that didn't really change much in the current regime. So, yeah, other ways of actually creating democracy is, is actually really giving people the power to have real democracy and actual democracy via very honest uh, votes and very honest um, let's say freedom and, and giving people actually the, the chance to stand up. We see in a lot of countries new movements that are not influenced by any political or external movement that the people really want to relate to, but those are not given the chance. Again, the reasons are, are, are many, and I'm trying not to go very political in this, but actually touch more on the humanitarian side of democracy and freedom in the Middle East. And I think that is what really deserves international attention at the moment. Okay. And um, do you think Arabs actually want democracy? Given that Arabs, or at least some countries are labeled as democratic, but they don't really have real democracy, I don't think what is sought for is the label anymore as much as the freedom, the freedom of speech, the freedom of 
breaking loose from a lot of chains that are really labeling those uh, cultures and those environments and really stepping closer and, and looking into the cultures. Those are very old stamps that people really suffer in terms of trying to show that they are more open, more liberal, that they want this, let's say, freedom of, of personal freedom, like in a lot of countries, um, sexual freedom does not exist in terms of, um, let's say, women don't have that freedom equally like men, or, or even the freedom to choose the intimate partner does, does not exist. So in, in, in that sense, I think what people want now is to be able to live um, a life where they have their rights. So I think labeled under democracy or not, people want that true option to choose who rules them, to choose how they wanna live and how, let's say, oppression-free they wanna go through their day-to-day -day lives. Okay, yeah. Um, and how did you think, like, could you explain a bit about what is the Arab Spring and how did it influence democracy? Well, I think it, it, it started from many different directions. And again, if I want to tackle it out of my experience in the region, rather than just the political uh, meanings of it and, and what was underhandedly um, the reason behind those different, um, let's say, uh, shouts for, for freedom and change. Well, in that sense, if I take the example of, of Lebanon recently, of course, the Lebanese reached a point where, where they've really had enough and they wanted to break loose from the current regime that is really oppressing them and that is abusing in, in all levels their, the, the well-being of, of the uh, Lebanese uh, population. However, in that sense, what is really happening is that, again, a, a lot of influence then comes to, to try to buy a stamp to put it on, on, on that revolution, you know, to, to try to say that it either it doesn't make sense because it has external influence or to say that it doesn't make sense because this is not what, what the people really want. So again, the, um, the, the movement is, is really not being given what it what was initially intended to, to have. And that's actually a pity because yeah, th there's a lot of potential in the region and there's a lot of hope by by citizens to break loose of those let's say stamps and the, this this irony that dictates unfortunately how uh or that dictates that freedom and takes it away so in that sense when um the arab spring started the hope of course was was change was the halt of external influence and um, let's say internal capabilities of of the younger generations to take the lead and to to help the, the countries move forward. But again, looking at the age group of, in the end, the leaders of of those countries, unfortunately, it goes back to an old generation, an old passion generation that already is is stamped by by certain political influence and preference that does not work to the best uh, benefit of of the country. So. In, in that sense, any of these revolutions will never come to a good, let's say, outcome without really actually applying what the people, the people with the free opinions actually want in those regions. And um, irrespective of whether, let's say, for example, we read in, in, in the news how homophobic uh, some countries are, et cetera, and that actually dictates what's, what is, really happening in terms of uh, governmental application against uh, those, those sects and those, those minority groups. Whereas really, if you go more in depth into the culture, if the culture is, is, is given the chance to, to say, we break this taboo and we accept perhaps this change can already start giving more personal freedoms and more openness to, to help people 
live a um, more reputable life, which, which actually they, they are capable of doing so on their own without any external influence. But yeah, back to the idea that that chance is not being given, unfortunately. Okay. Um, and do you think democracy then creates safety against like the tyranny and terror or? Well, it really depends huh? because so far what we see is that the label of democracy is there, but what really exists is actually a personal agenda of, of different regimes that really one want to apply what is best for, for that regime or for that uh, political group. So will democracy provide that safety to the people? I think on the long run, it, it could, but with the way things are going today, this is not what is going to provide those, those, those countries actually a safe haven or a safe way forward into true democracy and true freedom of, of, of living. So I think this democracy needs to be coupled with, let's say, um, true pro provision of rights and let's say neutral organizations that would truly assess breaches and that would be able to immediately target those breaches and, and, and block them so that the people can reach a point where they built their own governments and societies and their own, um, let's say, free governments and, 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 and cultures. Okay, thank you. Um, I think maybe Adolf also had a question. You're mute. Yeah, um, I also wondered, uh, maybe also for Alex, uh, what are your views on what a healthy democracy exactly is? Um, so is it purely the voting part or do you think that a democracy inherent, yeah, to have a healthy democracy, it is inherent to also have a basic respect for the fundamental rights uh, that we know in Europe? Um, or do you think that it's more important maybe to have the fundamental rights without the possibility to vote? Or um, what do you think that are the most important democratic values um, that also might be re realizable in uh, the Middle East? Do you want me to answer that? Uh, if you feel like, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I think, think as I kind of um, mentioned, I don't think democracy it does end at the ballot box. Um, I, and to be honest, like, one thing I, I would always like to get away from is the idea that Europe is um, necessarily a shining beacon on the hill when it comes to democracy either. And that, and that's, you know, the, the only solution for kind of social or economic or, or problems of personal freedoms in the Middle East is to sort of try and mirror France or Germany or Britain. Um, you know, there, there are, there are, there are many, I mean, democracy, you know, democracy is not just about um, changing your government every few years or so. It really does come down, in my view, to the kind of control you have over your day-to-day -day life. You know, what, what, what typifies, um, you know, the day-to-day -day life of people around the globe, and particularly in the developing world, is, you know, um, you know uh, uh, their, their working lives that are based on, you know, a, a maximum of, you know, toiling under in insecure conditions and very poor working conditions for very little money and a minimization of um, personal time, which is also an issue that's a problem in you know, the West as well. And so you know, the, the, question of, the question of how much of your life do you get to um, you know, dispose of at your own will should come into it as well. And I think part of the problem with the way we viewed certain countries in the Middle East, um, such as like um, Tunisia, for example, is that there's been, there is a big um, backlash there. Um, since, um, you know, since the Arab Spring and since, you know, Tunisia has been declared to be supposedly the one successful um, liberal democracy because my, many of the actual desires and um, uh, kind of goals of the people who originally uh, drove out Ben Ali have not been fulfilled because what's fundamentally happened in Tunisia is, is that the, the previous authoritarian regime has been replaced with a less authoritarian regime, but one which is still largely based on the same sort of 
economic principles and, and which has attempted to try and use kind of like te technocrats and like to try and reform the economy there. And ultimately, I think a lot of people have realized that just pushing for, you know, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, and, um, you know, a, a f reasonably fair, uh, you know, ballot box, which, you know, are all important, but, but that, that can't be the limit of things. You do need to inject um, politics into it. You know, I mean, one simple example of this would be things like um, having a strong trade union movement, you know, which is obviously something which doesn't really exist throughout much of the Middle East. Although Tunisia, one of the reasons I think it is the exception with the Arab Spring is that it did have and does have a relatively strong trade union movement. And things like this are what actually matters to people's day-to-day -day lives and about how much control they actually have over their day-to-day -day lives. So it can't, it can't just be politics is something you do every five years or so. It has to be a continuous process. Uh, Sam, do you have anything to uh, add to that? <laughs> well, I, I, I definitely, it, it's completely aligned with what I, what I previously said, and I completely agree um, with, with this point of view. I mean, um, yeah, people in, in, in various countries uh, in the Middle East or in the Levant are, are given the chance to vote, but that vote is not really leading to that uh, real democracy. So. Is it only about voting? No. And again, when the voting is, is done right, it's it's about having consistency and righteousness in, in the governments and the um, political opinions that in the end rule uh, the countries that most importantly, they reflect what the, the, the people want and more even more importantly, that they reflect what the youth really want um, and not the, the old, uh, stamped generation of, of, of politicians. Thank you. Um, yesterday, uh, Matthew, uh, Dr. Matthew Krippen, uh, also spoke about uh, the concept of democratic faith. And it was important that um, the people in one country uh, trust one another and that there is a possibility for dialogue um, and yeah, that there's kind of a mutual trust and belief in the democratic project. Um, do you think that it's possible in, for example, Bahrain, uh, where there is, yeah, there is a split, I think, between the Shiites and the Sunnis? Um, do you think that it's possible, or is that a very polarized uh, minority, for example, or is the distinction between the two, is it very polarized, which might make it more difficult, or do they live in, yeah, uh, harmony, you know, yeah. Do they, are they able to uh, live um, and have talks within the same parliament? Well, I mean, oh, really? prior to, I mean, fam famously, like when the Arab Spring protest started, um, there wasn't necessarily a particularly sectarian element there. And, and there were always um, uh, high profile leaders from the Sunni community as well as part of it. And a lot of people suggested that the Bahraini regime moves to arrest and crack down on the Sunni um, activists, pro-democracy activists, quicker than they did Shia ones, because that way they could um, present the uh, uprising as being a, uh, a Shia uprising and as an existential threat to the, to the Sunnis there, as well as also being able to say, oh, well, it's, it's all Iran, it's been agitated by Iran. Um, you know, I mean, there's no, I mean, you know, sectarianism, anywhere is not is not a fact of life you know i mean what people what what the, the people who try and present it as being some kind of ancient um you know fundamental conflict you know going back a thousand years ago you know those are the people who have an interest in stoking it um and they don't believe it themselves either it, it is it is in the interests of 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 the powerful to keep um, the majority, you know, the kind of the mass of people divided. And so, you know, sectarianism as an idea in Bahrain and Iraq or uh, Lebanon, anywhere, is something which, you know, it, it, it ebbs and flows, it dies down, it rises, and usually according to the interests of people who, the interests of the people who want to soak it. But there's actually nothing fundamental about it. You know, when you strip it all away, what, what, what ultimately uh, drives people is, is kind of basic needs and the a need for like kind of personal liberty you know um 
And I think, I mean, just like a slight tangent, but I think Iraq at the moment is a very good example of this. You know, the, the, the pro-democracy movement there in the last couple of years has been, you know, rem remarkably anti-sectarian, despite the fact people said for years that, you know, Iraq was fundamentally divided on the kind of Shia Sunni splits, you know, irrevocably. There, there's been a staunch uh, move towards, you know, a strong move towards, you know, a decisively anti-sectarian politics there as well, and, and, and also pushing ultimately for a kind for secular governance that doesn't favor one sector or the other. So it, it, it happens. And people said in Iraq it would never happen because it was just so fundamental. And only a few years later, there's look, you know, millions of people who are saying very vocally, we're not sectarian, we want to oppose sectarianism, and the people who are stoking sectarianism are just doing it to divide us. So it's, it's, there's nothing, there's no fact of life about any of this stuff. It's, it's, it's stoked by interesting part. Oh, thank you. Um, Sam, do you want to say something also about it? Well, um, if I take the same question that I apply to, to Lebanon, going back into the civil, civil war, of course, there was that split up between the, the Christian side of the country and then the Muslim side of the country. And now people have really learned that lesson that that they have to be together one hand and to to be able to actually create a better life but but then again if you look in 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 general on on how some things are invoking what's happening internally the idea of trying to push people again to break based on religion is 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 again that's uh, the main let's say string that is uh, very delicate between people staying united and then or or another civil war breaking again what is what is nice is if you go more in depth into the opinions of people and the youth and reading more into the different um, opinions on, on on social media um, it's always good to see that people are aware that this seed of conflict of internal conflict is is there's an attempt to plant it, but um, there's a, a vast agreement on trying as much as possible to, to push that down and to really maintain um, unanimity and, and, and cohesion in that sense to, to avoid a civil war and to make sure that these movements for change actually serve the purpose and not in the end Take the countries back 20 years into history. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I maybe have one question uh, for Alex or Sam, whoever wants to answer. Uh, so Dr. Pippen also stated that Western leaders are more more concerned about their perceiving like their own interests in the Middle East than the actual protection of human rights. Uh, what is your take on that in like Lebanon or Iran or something? Shall, shall I speak? <laughs> please, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, well, yes. I mean, it's like it's unequivocally the case. Um, I, I mean, I think what a, a lot of activists in a lot of these countries might be more frustrated by is probably the kind of double standards that are expressed a lot of the time. Um, I, I think, you know. Far be it for me to ever say anything positive about Trump, but the one thing Trump did do while in power was he did sort of take the mask away a bit on, on a number of issues. You know, he, he kind of said to a lot of the regimes which America has been long friendly to, you know, we're your mates, do what you want. Um, while other American presidents would have spoken, you know, loudly about human rights while turning a blind eye to human rights abuses. Um, honestly, I just think, I think in terms of, I think, I think when it comes to the kind of relations between the West and, um, regimes that are involved in human rights abuses, I just think that when it, 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 it needs, there needs to be a radical political break before there can be any real change in those relationships. And it's not going to come as a result of, um, sort of guilt over, human rights abuses or, 
or that sort of thing, you know, because there's no indication that's how states work when it comes to foreign policy. Um, it, it, it will always be pursuing, um, you know, they will always be pursuing what is perceived to be the national interests of the country, even if that occasionally aligns with human rights, supporting human rights. Nevertheless, it's not going to be chosen on that basis. Um, you know, ultimately, the only thing that will kind of drive states to, you know, support human rights and to take those kind of pro-human rights, pro-democracy positions on any of these issues is um, popular pressure. And, and, the, and the idea that it gets you pressured, pressure them to actually think that it will be, you know, a drawback and there will be some sort of consequences for it. Um, you know, and that has been seen in past. I mean, like the obvious example in history was South Africa, where, you know, there was enough of a mass movement there to actually drive um, change there. But it, it won't happen through, um, you know, sort of, you know, uh, civil servants negotiating with, you know, leaders in the home, in the, in the, in the State Department or, or in the Foreign Office in the UK or any of this kind of thing. It takes, it takes widespread political pressure. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sam, do you have anything to add? Well, that's the topic that I always try to avoid because, again, I, I don't really like to, to okay. go into details into politics. But um, indeed, it's obvious that instability in the Middle East serves some external bigger purpose that is, of course, perceived of benefit to one side or, or another. And that's, that's clear from, from what's happening on the Levant on, or on the Mediterranean coast between um, Palestine, Syria, and Lebanon, and definitely, definitely, as as the international society uh, environment uh, needs democracy for the Middle East, there is this hidden agenda to maintain some sort of instability for, um, let's say, individual uh, gains. Okay, thank you. Ido, um, do you have another question? Um, yeah, it was, there was one thing, <laughs> but it's, it might be a bit uh, specific. Um, uh, Alexia also mentioned um, that Bahrain, uh, and maybe you could repeat a little bit the part, I was also waiting for the British agreement uh, for a certain policy, um, but I missed a little bit on what it was exactly. Uh, but I was also wondering about that part. Um, Oh, since, it's just, yeah. sorry, go again. Uh, so since uh, Bahrain uh, was colonialized by uh, you know, uh, Great Britain uh, until 1970s, I think, um, do they still have a big impact uh, on the democracy there? Um, and how are those relations? And since, as you say, that they are waiting for a certain agreement, um, are there any yeah, interlinks between that and the colonial past? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say, you know, Britain, Britain largely, I would say, is the main sponsor of Bahrain on the international stage. I mean, more, more so than America uh, or any other nation. Um, and that is linked to the, um, to the whole, to the kind of colonial past. I mean, famously, people say that when, when, the, when the British said they were, uh, you know, pulling out of Bahrain in the 70s, the rulers begged them to stay, you know. Um, so it's, you know, it's always, it's always been a very um, close relationship there. And um, it's interesting, I was talking to one, one Bahraini activist who said that she was very, um, she was very happy in some respects that Britain had now left the European Union because when Britain was in the European Union, they were basically the biggest kind of, you know, block in terms of preventing any kind of, um, you know, any, any action by the European Union on Bahrain, because Britain was always there to kind of shoot down any sort of, you know, uh, censure for, for, for the kingdom, you know. And yeah, and, and, and as, as I mentioned, you know, I mean, Britain is currently trying to make a, you know, trying to make Brexit, leaving the European Union work. And that means there's going to be very little sort of attention paid to you know, human rights concerns around the world at the moment because, you know, the economic um, concerns are going to be, you know, prime, you know, prime there. So, I mean, you know, uh, Britain has spent a very long time now pr protecting Bahrain and that's 
unlikely to change uh, anytime soon. Um, yeah. And then also, I mean, part of it's, it's also a kind of post empire nostalgia, like, you know, Britain establishing that uh, and establishing naval base in Bahrain in 2018. I mean, you can, you can, you can debate the actual practical gains of that, but a lot of this really does stem from, you know, this sort of need by a lot of politicians in Britain to feel like they're reasserting Britain on the global stage and kind of, you know, putting, you know, uh, sort of having a presence in the areas they used to control during the uh, glory days of the British Empire. You know, so there's a lot of that kind of nationalist uh, flag waving sort of uh, stuff in there as well. And, and Bahrain is very much part of that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, oh, I'm out of questions. <laughs> so I know if you're yeah, me as well. So uh, maybe we can also also, uh, get in there. Uh, so I think we'll wrap up there. Yeah. Um, I, uh, yeah, you're um yeah so thank you for uh coming both of you um it was very interesting um both of your talks and uh, answers to our questions we learned a lot and so this is a part of our webinar series and the next one will be in two weeks on political islam and modern europe like clash or harmony um so yeah thank you a lot um Edo, anything to add? Or... Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, again, uh, thank you for uh, making the time to participate. All right. Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. So the first question we had uh, was a bit of a theoretical one. Uh, so can you explain uh, the etymological and historical meanings of democracy and uh, maybe how they are respected in a general overview? Okay, so I mean, etymologically, the word democracy comes from Greek words, and it simply means empowering people. And so etymologically, the word has nothing to do with voting. Now, of course, historically, voting has been a part of how people exercise um, democratic will. But when you look at what people have you know, fought for when they've been fighting for democracy, a lot of times it isn't this petty, shallow stuff. And moreover, it, it's very specifically hasn't been to disempower people. So to give like certain examples, like in Canada, in um, I can't remember the year. But Canada, they had Canada had the first gay marriage, and the, they were the second country to legalize it. Um, you know, but at the time that it was legalized, most Canadians were against it, and most parliamentary most parliamentarians were also against it. So everybody was screaming, "This is undemocratic!" And then there's a very intelligent parliamentarian who I heard interviewed, and she just says, "You know." This is missing nuances of democracy because, again, you're you're both systematically and arbitrarily stripping people of power. And so, even supposing that you come from a traditional religious background and you don't approve of it, nobody's asking you to get married. There's these people over here, and this is you, okay? And I don't think, like, I mean, again, times change. So I'm, I'm not saying like, um, you know, if you go back, you know, 200 years ago, people would have been fighting for gay marriage. But I, I do think that when they've been fighting for democracy, they've been specifically fighting for individual empowerment. And you see this with all sorts of, you know, movements for freedom around the world. So you, you see this in India, you see this in, in um, you know, the Americas, you see this in certain European contexts, and you saw this in Egypt too. And in, and in Egypt, like the Arab Spring, which of course failed, but it included, you know, secular people, it included Muslims, it included Christians, it really actually included rich, poor, and, you know, I think they were all interested in, you know, individual empowerment, which none of them had. And so I think, you know, if you're looking at democracy historically, you know, that's has to, that that relates to what it means. And then the, then the etymological meaning um, suggests similarly, but I do think it's very dangerous just to reduce democracy to voting. And it's, it's a pretty shallow point I'm making. But again, like people in the media miss it, politicians miss it. I, I think people in everyday life miss it. So I think it's an important point that we wanna keep in mind and further that even voting can be put to un undemocratic purposes if you're systematically and arbitrarily stripping people of their individual liberty. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, if you write, for example, that uh, democracy in the UN um, and a conception is Kind of simplistic uh, compared to like prominent thinkers uh, like uh, uh, Foucault, I think you mentioned. Um, I 
rank for the pool. Um, yeah, how do you, how do you compare those to them? Uh, for example, how should the UN uh, <clears throat> how could the UN grow maybe towards a more uh, prominent way of thinking about democracy? Um, like, like when it comes to the UN, like first, I, I want to be clear, like I, on the whole, I like the UN, so I'm not any UN. I, I do think there's sort of certain colonialist elements and so far, uh, insofar as it's promoting, you know, classical liberalism and it sort of, you know, almost tends to sort of operate on the idea that one model is okay for all of the world, which is, you know, in itself totalitarian and, you know, the UN in terms of its history started out as something that was meant to be, um, you know, to keep, you know, stuff like the Third Reich at, at, at bay. Um, but having said that, like, I, I think there's a lot of, you know, in the UN documents, I mean, it, it's, it, it's a little bit shallow, but I, I, you know, I don't really, it's, it's kind of difficult to avoid because if you're, if you're trying to lay out kind of points that you want to defend, like point A, point B, point C, you know, point D in terms of a legal framework, you know, it, it's hard to get into like a Frankfurt analysis of, you know, democracy in that case. So some strengths of the UN documents are that they, um, I mean, there is a lot in there about, you know, um, you know, not systematically disempowering people. So in, in the UN uh, documents, I mean, they don't, I think, go right out and say it, although of course I haven't read every last document, but I think they do have the idea, you know, that you don't want to reduce democracy to mere voting. Um, at the same time, there's some stuff that's contradictory because it defends, you know, parents' rights to educate their children as they see fit and to, you know, teach their children, their religious values. So again, if your religion happens to be one that systematically discriminates against women or, you know, uh, promotes female genital mutilation, which I, I will add in passing, it's not a, really a Muslim practice. And so in Egypt is practiced equally among Christians and uh, Muslims, but, you know, that would be problematic. But at the same time, I almost admire the fact that, there, that there's some contradictions in the UN reasoning because the world is um, complicated. So I think the world overflows logic and sort of straightforward reasoning and so i think if you actually had a perfectly consistent set of rules um laid down that did not lead to any sort of contradiction i think that would be even more problematic um but i think when people are talking about various countries i think they could talk with a little more depth so again like during the morsi coup in egypt which um at the time i don't want to say it but i, I was actually for it i'm, I'm eating my words now because like cc was like so much worse but um um, but like Morsi was voted in, okay, but just because you're voted in does not mean you're behaving in a democratic manner. And, and I mean, he, he, you know, did everything to kind of thwart, you know, conventions of democracy, but the Western media, and I'm not really sure what the UN response was, but I suspect it was similar where they're like, you know, he was voted in, he must serve his whole term, otherwise it's undemocratic. And I'm like, it doesn't follow. I mean, you know, you can have people that are voted in that are undemocratic. So my, I mean, I think my complaint about the UN would sort of be my same complaint about Western media and everyday thinking is people just don't think things through. And so Morsi was a tyrant, even though he was, I don't think it's evil, by the way, but he was a tyrant, even though he was voted in. And I mean, you know, Hitler was elected the first time, mind you, with a minority vote. But I mean, so these are these are problems that I think persist, you know, uh, in the media, and I think to some extent in the UN documents, but not really a direct answer, but I tried. You know. So the West tends to impose their values upon other countries, um, especially when it comes to the West's perspective on like a liberal concept of democracy. Do you think that maybe this is also why we have a hard time accepting the way things work in the Middle East? Yeah, well, yeah, so I, to begin with, like there's sort of this idea that, I mean, you know, as I argue in the paper, I don't even think we have genuine democracy in the West and I can elaborate on that later if you want. But there's this notion that like politics as we practice it in the West is a model, not only for the entire world, but for the entire universe. Like so in Star Wars, it's a galaxy far, far away in a time long, long ago. But Queen, Queen, I can't remember her name, Queen Amidala or whatever her name is, like after she's a queen, but she's elected or something. After she serves her two four-year terms, you know, she retires because that, you know, because of course in a galaxy far, far away, you know, in a, you know, time long, long ago, of course, they practice things just as the Americans do. And so I think like that's um, deeply problematic. But again, we, we also tend to focus on stuff that's petty and shallow. So you'll get like, you know, like people finger wagging about how, you know, Muslim women dress. And, and like this happened in, in Can Quebec, Canada, which is the, the French speaking part, but also in France. 
you know, where they're even banning, like, say, sports hijabs. And sports hijabs, they're banning on the ground that they're dangerous. They're not dangerous at all. Okay, and and there, but there's this notion, say, if a woman chooses to wear a, um, you know, I'm not talking about the full mask. I can talk about that too if you want. But if a woman chooses, you know, to wear a hijab, that somehow she's oppressed. And and again, like I don't see how Western standards of dress are any more liberating for females or even for men. Like if it's on a hot day, you know, in many contexts, I have to wear this. I can't come in like wearing a sleeveless, you know, shirt. You know, I I, I legally could wear a dress in Canada, but it, you know, it would be kind of weird, you know, if I did this, you know, and so on and so forth. So we have sexually enforced codes of dress. So so again, there's this notion that you know politics as we practice it is the only model. That's problematic. But then when we're kind of going after a lot of these countries, we, we focus on petty stuff rather than, you know, say in the case of Saudi Arabia, focusing on the, there was a, you know, a Canadian um, young woman who, um, Canadian Saudi who was, who was there. And uh, when she wanted to leave, her Saudi family didn't approve of her boyfriend. So she was stuck there for two years. I mean, that's something we should be focusing on, you know, yeah. or, um, you know, female genital mutilation, which occurs around the world. These are things worth focusing on, but not like, style of dress I mean let people dress how they want to dress and and so I think a lot of it is just shallow and I think that's one problem the second problem is that we think that you know one model of doing politics is good for the entire world and, and the entire premise is totalitarian I mean you, you could there's you know I think Bhutan was actually one of the happiest countries in the world they had monarchy I think since then they switched to uh, democracy but again like different you, you can't presume that something that works in one time and place is going to work in all times and places I think it's just bad thinking okay. And do you think that, for example, if you focus on a pet, I think I lost the connection a bit. Yeah, it always uh, stuck. Uh, uh, oh. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, if what do you think is the right balance in the democracy between more paternalistic aspects and um, more like yeah uh, more libertarian aspects for let the people be who they want to be but which would include um, just raising them as they see fit or do you think that the government should have in a healthy democracy should have kind of a paternalistic traits yeah i mean it, it, I, like again, if I if I were to if I were to make claims there, I'd be contradicting what I just said about you know imposing one vision on everything. But in terms of my own personal preferences, um, you, you know, like I'm not a thoroughgoing libertarian when it comes to free expression. In that regard, I'm libertarian. Um, but you know, like I, I you know I, I happen to like a good public health care system and a good public education system. I think there's benefits, but then not every country can afford this. Like, like in Egypt, like it just isn't possible. Like, I, and by the way, the healthcare is, is troubling because if you're poor, you don't get in and that's deeply troubling to me. But like the government just doesn't have the funds, okay? Um, having said that, Egypt is by no means, you know, advancing kind of libertarian um, values. But like, so my, my personal preference is, you know, kind of a mix of the two, you know, like, you know, public, you know, I like a social safety net, I like, you know, public health care, like public education. But I think when it comes to free expression, people should be able to say and do and, you know, dress as they, they please. I think that's important. But again, like for me to kind of impose that model on the world would be violating what I just said. But I think a, I think a healthy dialogue is good. So if you get people talking and, you know, learning, you know, what certain cultures do well and listening, I think that can create a, you know, a, a better situation. And then you're also not imposing one vision on everybody. Okay, thank you, and I agree. Okay. Um, do you think Western leaders are more concerned about securing their own perceived interests in the Middle East than the actual human well-being? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, clearly, and and um, but the, the the sort of irony of it all is that it very rarely works out in their own self-interest. So if you take um, you know, supplying weapons to what became the Taliban because they were fighting the Soviets. That didn't work out so well for the Americans or supporting Saddam Hussein. There's even recent data suggesting that the US and, and Europe uh, not only supplied components to make chemical weapons, but supplied tactical information on how they could um, deploy them. But I mean, that didn't work out so well either. But I think there's a whole history of um, the West acting and its perceived self-interest. So with Rwanda, for example, 
you know, you could have put like 30,000 ground troops in there with minimal risk because the the forces you were dealing with were mostly like people with machetes. So if you put in a modern, you know, and uh, nobody could bother, you know, the US and France vetoed that. And, um, you know, and uh, so you had a massacre there, you know, uh, we intervened in, um, you know, Kosovo, but even there, I think it was kind of to stick it to the Russians because in Serbia, you know, they see everything through the Russian lens. So like in Serbia, like a lot of people think Gaddafi is a great guy because he's an ally of the Russians. So like, I, I think that very often, it, I think I think typically uh, people are acting in what they perceive to be their economic and political self-interest very rarely I mean, I, I go on and on, like Pinochet in Chile, you know, uh, certain Central American, even, even Iran, you know, had a functional government, I think in the 1950s or 60s, and, you know, but then they wanted to nationalize their oil, you know, hence the West propped up a, a bad government, the Iranians got fed up, then you have the 1979 revolution, which of course, most people living in Iran are not happy with their government, they actually tend to like American culture and, and so forth. But like, yeah, I mean, so I think it's very, it's, it, it's, it's the exception when you have countries acting, you know, uh, in the interest of, you know, um, you know, democracy and human rights. I mean, the, the rule is that most countries act in their own self-interest, but what I would add is I think this ends up not being in their own self-interest. When you look at it historically, it just ends up making a mess. And of course, nobody believes the US these days when they say they're doing this for the good of the world or whatever. And uh, 30 or 40 years ago, they might have. And, and I think, so yeah, so I, I don't think that, that typically countries are acting to promote you know democracy and human rights, and but I think it also comes back to bite them. So I, I wish they would rethink this a little bit. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think Edo has the next question. I think you're muted. You're muted. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so for the UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, yeah, they kind of avoid addressing the democratic values and basic human rights. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, do you think that democracy is necessary for to have a sustainable future? Like, I think if you if you define maybe democracy in the sense of individual empowerment, that I, I would be willing to say sure i think it's important i think individual empowerment is important and i don't i think there's i think there's very few people you'll find in the world that don't want that if, if by democracy you mean like politics as pra practice in the west then no i don't necessarily think that that's better for a um you know a sustainable future in terms of the un you know um development stuff like again you know i think they have a good agenda and so forth but you know as i say in the paper if you go to their website you'll see all these pictures of people with darker skin and colorful clothing you know smiling because they're so happy because and, and it and 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 so i it's like again i i think these days people are going sort of too far like I, i'm all for a cultural appropriation if you're appropriating a culture and making something better i have no problem with that okay like the beatles did it for example you know they culturally have been so I, i'm not that's not kind of the line of argument i'm advancing here but but I, I think that like when you look at the pages they are kind of it's almost like the idea you know on these pages is that you have you know us who are kind of civilized and have our stuff together and you have these people that are still kind of barbaric and they need our help to kind of get their act together and i think if that's your attitude um towards various regions i don't see that being especially productive and again i lived in egypt for six and a half years i, I love the country i mean and again there's certain things that bother me a great deal there, but there's all sorts of things that Westerners don't see. And one thing I, I would even add about places like Egypt or, or even Myanmar, which I've visited not that recently, by the way, but uh, is that in certain ways they're freer than we are in the West. Like having lived in Egypt, um, when I came back to, um, right, right now I'm not, I'm actually in the East, but, but, but I'm in an industrialized country. But when I came back to industrialized um, countries, I actually found um, it really kind of over-regulated. Now, Egypt is a little bit too chaotic for me, but on the immediate level of everyday life, people kind of do what they want when they want. If they want to sell something, they just, you know, tap up a, a, a little store and start selling stuff, a license, what's a license? Why would I need a license? By the way, I've never gotten sick from street food. If I were to get kidney damage, I would be, maybe be telling you a different story about this, but but um, but these are things that people miss, you know, like they sometimes I think, because they think like in the West, we know about freedom and all these other people, they don't know about freedom. Well. You know, if you're talking about, you know, broad political ideas, you know, um, you know, sexual freedom, religious freedom, sure. Okay, in the West, we probably have more of that. But if you're talking about everyday things like Egypt, it's actually one of the freest countries I've ever been in, you know, 
but also very oppressed. But uh, I can't even remember what the initial question was. I think I went off on a digression, but I apologize for that. Oh yeah, yeah you're the about... UN development program. But yeah, so it actually does relate to the UN development program with this idea that, you know, kind of like we're, we're, we have our act together and we're, you know, we know what's good and we're going to teach you ignorant people how to get your act together. I, I think that type of attitude, I don't think is necessarily the most productive attitude. Thank you. <laughs> that was very interesting. Uh, okay. In your paper, you write on the concept of democratic faith. Could you elaborate on that, what it means? Yeah, okay, so democratic faith, like, um, do we advance the idea? And although, I, insofar as I remember the reading in which he advanced it, he's not citing James, but you can relate it to something William James said. So John Dewey and William James are American philosophers. And, uh, you know, these days are coming very much back into vogue after many years in the shadows. But um, but William James, he, he gives a nice example. By, by the way, both were very scientifically literate. This actually relates to their concept. But um, and it's also even their ideas sort of relate to like contemporary physics and so forth. But anyways, to put it in plain terms, William James has this notion where he says that, you know, your beliefs generate certain actions and your actions generate consequences that all things equal are likely to verify your beliefs. So suppose I just am meeting you guys for the first time and I'm like, oh, you guys are from Northern Europe. Northern Europe, are, Northern Europeans are cold, probably thieves too and so forth. And if I behave in a really kind of cold, distant manner towards you, I really wish I'd turned off that email. I apologize for that. But if I behave in a cold and distant manner towards you, um, you know, you're probably not going to be friendly and like crack jokes with me and sit down. And then I'll say, see, I was right. They're cold, they're distant. You know, they're not nice people. Whereas if, on the other hand, I behave in a trusting manner and if I'm warm and so forth, all things equal, you're likely to respond in kind. Okay. So that's an example. I, I could go through hundreds of examples with physics and all sorts of other things. Okay. But William James says, so he says, you're beliefs lead to certain actions and your actions all things equal generate certain beliefs so a few things follow from this he says all things equal you're better to believe in what you want to be true now if you have evidence that it's not true then fine don't believe it but like you know if you don't have evidence then why not believe in what you want so like imagine you have like a you know a boy and a girl and the girl likes the boy or whatever and uh and supposedly she's not being like creepy or stalky but she just says like hey you want to go study after class and if, if the guy says, yeah, then, you know, maybe there's a little bit of evidence that she likes him. And maybe he doesn't, maybe he doesn't even like her romantically at first, but maybe they start studying and over time they fall in love, et cetera. Okay. But the point is if she doesn't take action, nothing happens and taking action typically requires a degree of faith. Okay. And to put this in, in terms of um, the political realm, well, I mean, Dewey just, I mean, Dewey, when he's talking about democratic faith, he's a very humble thinker. He says, I'm not saying anything new or interesting. But he just says for democracy to work, you have to have a situation where people feel that they can trust one another, where they can sit down and talk. Okay, so some examples that are contrary um, to this is, is Libya. So in Libya, um, so in a situation like this, it gets very insular and you stop getting dialogue. Okay, and to, to use uh, another example, like in the United States, like, um, or, or Canada, uh, the Muslim community tends to be a little bit insular. Okay, so why are they insular? Well, because, you know, sometimes people treat them in a hostile way. And also there's a little bit of mistrust going on both sides. So maybe they're worried about, you know, the, you know, uh, you know, Western morality or whatever impacting their kids and people, you know, they, they're worried about these strange Muslims and so forth. And so you get, you get people start generating very strange ideas um, about one another, it becomes very insular. And suddenly you have, you know, these two groups that don't really interact that much. And you see something similar in, um, you know, even American politics these days, you know, and, and so as soon as you kind of get this sort of insular situation in society, um, John Dewey argues that, you know, democracy really can't um, function. And so in the United States, you, you actually see this fairly emphatically, you know, under current conditions. So that's basically John Dewey's concept of pragmatic faith. Thank you. Um, to go to a little bit of another topic, uh, do you think that Western leaders are more concerned about secure and perceived interests than human well-being in uh, foreign countries? I, I asked that question earlier. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh yeah, I missed that one and then I went to another room, I think. Sorry. <laughs> I think you can ask uh, your last question, maybe? Or... Uh, yep. Yeah. 
yes. Okay. So you write about uh, the rather conservative way that a lot of people practice Islam in the uh, Middle East compared to Western standards. Uh, what does that mean for the Islam in Europe? Uh, is it possible to have something yeah, what they call an uh, European Islam if a big part of the Islam elsewhere does not fully cohere with yeah, Western democratic principles? I think it just depends on who you ask. Like, I mean, my understanding is that there is a gay mosque in Europe, but then if you ask, you know, typical people in Egypt, they'll just say that's a contradiction in terms. What I would point out about Islam is it's not any more conservative than standard Christianity. So, I mean, if, if you if you're if you're going on what the uh, the papacy says, I mean, that's equally as conservative as Islam. I mean, the uh, Eastern Orthodox religious religious traditions are also you know exceedingly conservative by those standards. So I, you know, you know, um, the Muslim attitude is that, you know, God has conveyed certain things to us. These things are right. Um, even among traditional Muslims, though, there's a lot of variation, you know, there are actually are some, you know, you know, LTGB, you know, Muslims. Now, again, the mainstream Muslims would sort of say this doesn't work. Okay. But then there's other people that just sort of say like, you know, you know, I don't approve of homosexuality, but they're not, I wouldn't call them anti-gay. They're not like obsessed with it. You know, they have gay friends, you know, and there's Christians like this too. Muslims say coming, you know, from wherever into Europe, if they accept, you know, that you have um, these principles of individual rights, and these are the same principles that allow them to practice their religion freely, um, that I really don't think there should be that much conflict. And I don't think most of the time there is. I, I think when you get, I mean, I mean, obviously, yes. I mean, you have somebody who draws a picture of the prophet Muhammad in France and you have some crazy person that kills them. But, but most Muslims are not happy. Like most Muslims, when there's a terrorist attack in Egypt, like they're like, please don't let it be Muslim. Please don't let it be. They're like, please don't. Like they're really kind of, I mean, because it, it's sort of their group and they don't like it. I mean, e Egypt actually ranks with Finnish people for being against any kind of violence against uh, civilians for any reason. Okay, so... Um, I, I don't really think there's any problem because I mean, again, if you're a genuine liberal, then you should welcome all views on the table and you should welcome a variety of people as long as they're not forcing their beliefs on you. Okay. And, and I, I do, by the way, think there's a lot of things that the West can learn from Muslims. I think there's a lot of things that Muslims can learn from, you know, like Muslims in the Middle East can learn from the West. So again, I think dialogue is the key, but I really don't think that, yeah, I just don't really see why people think there's so much friction. Yes, you'll get you know, some uh, Syrian who comes in who like kills somebody or whatever, but you'll get like, I mean, Americans are one of the most violent people in the world. You know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna, if you're gonna judge people on likelihood to kill people, then really men should be admitted into countries. Like men are statistically far more likely to commit murder than women. So, so again, it, it's always like out of proportion. Like, so I don't see like European countries, you know, saying, oh, you know, how can we integrate men into our society? I mean, after all, men are so violent. I mean, you know, I, I think I think being male is a, is a much higher predictor for violence than religious affiliation. So there's just things like this. I I just I just don't really see it as a problem. You know, and and um, you know, and and we'll see we'll see how things evolve. You know, like some religions are, are um, you know, like the Anglican the Anglican Church has sort of you know um, you know has sort of grown with the times. But then there's other religions that sort of say you know at you know the way things were. 1500 years ago or 2000 years ago is right. So the Catholic church is sort of more, if you're following official doctrine, it's sort of more in line with that. And Islam, if you're following official doctrine, it's more in line with that. But again, I don't, I don't really see a huge problem. I think it's fine having a range of views on the table, you know, as long as people aren't forcing them on other people. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think yeah, we'll uh, have to uh, wrap it up about there. Um, yeah, thank you again for your time. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, yeah, uh, kind of outside of the recording. Uh,